First thing I would have to say is that I am so delighted to see the mayor of mobility has just joined us. One of the great uh, bike advocates in all of Los Angeles <laughs> and our progressive hero, our dear mayor, mayor Megan Sally Wells. So I know, I know she's racing from event to event tonight, probably. But Megan, can I can I put you on the spot and get you to come up and, and welcome everyone and to to welcome John. Hi. Thank you. Hey, um, so happy to see you. I'm I'm kind of um, I'm elated to to listen to to you speak and to hear to welcome all of you here tonight. I'm also elated because I just got an electric bike. And it is the bomb. So if you can help me convince my husband to get rid of our car, <laughs> yes. you'll be doing me a good one. So, um, the, because we know that this is the direction that we need to go. The, the status quo of one person, one car is literally killing us. And uh, our general plan update is the op opportunity for us to look beyond the present and really ensure that we have a future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you Megan. And I, I see we've also been joined by a couple of important urbanists there in the back, uh, architect Gerhard Meyer and Patricia Bivut, our, our uh, uh, urban planner from Amsterdam. Um, but I am so, I, I'm Thomas Small, one of your city council members, and someone who's been been uh, trying to push these ideas of new mobility since I've been on city council, uh, and was very involved in the in our uh, transit-oriented uh, district visioning process, um, and have been involved in the general plan and and particularly in mobility in regard to the general plan. And I am so thrilled uh, to welcome my dear friend John Rassant to join us. Um, and it's it's uh, it's pretty fun to get in, get to introduce him because he's a pretty unusual guy. The the uh, if you if you ever if you Google him and you look on Wikipedia and you and you and you sort of click on the links, you can see that he comes from this fascinating family. That he is uh, a born and bred American New Yorker, but with deep European, deep and interesting European roots. Um, and then he ended up going back to Europe uh, himself, you know, for his professional life, and spent a lot of time as a journalist in and and sort of a journalist scholar, I think of uh, you know, in 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 Italy, in France, uh, and, and and in the Middle East, with a lot of a lot of expertise and time in the Middle East. Um, so the the then his his official. Uh, Positions now, so I find that background very fascinating because it's really, it's really very much involved in sort of the immigrant history, really, of what I think of as kind of the most important movements of the late 20th century, early early 21st century. So all of all of that that sort of immigrant mentality is something something that 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 I think is really ingrained in the history in in his biography and in the history of his family. That informs all of this and the, and the relationships between those things. But he he is he is so he was the other thing that I'm going to ask him about tonight that we'll do a little later is that he was very involved in with the World Economic Forum and their their famous uh, conference that they have in Davos uh, for many many years. And he actually just got back from there. So I'm going to so alongside our mobility stuff, I'm eager to get kind of a report from what what how that has developed and changed and what he might think about it. Um, but he is the founder and chairman of the New Cities Foundation, a major global nonprofit network devoted to improving the quality of life and work in 21st century cities. Um, he's also the CEO of CoMotion uh, and events and and media platform that hosts the the uh, the Comotion LA festival, which is all about mobility. It's, and it's a it's Comotion is a is a new animal. It is a fascinating kind of conference. 
that really wants to seems wants to attract like a broad public, and yet also kind of the cream of the cream of the professionals in in mobility and trans and transportation, both locally, regionally, nationally, and even internationally. So it's kind of I remember when I first saw the the announcement, the advertising for the first Comotion Festival. I, I couldn't I, I, I couldn't figure it out because I, I you know I've gone to sort of the professional one for a number of years, but this is Comotion is a different animal, and and it's also a festival of mobility in that it, it, it along with panels and presentations and sort of your standard conferencing, they also have all of Toys, all, all of the, all of the, all you know, you can you can ride autonomous vehicles. You can try out every new kind of scooter there is. But it's a fascinating animal, and and it's it's, uh, and now now he's taking it also to Miami as well as as Los Angeles. And so it, it changes the entire uh, supply chain and the whole manufacturing process to actually print the parts of the cars. Yeah. Um, Rather than rather than building in the traditional way, so it could change that whole process. Well, the thing about the mobility revolution that I think is so interesting you know, is that it is truly disruptive. And so you have, you know, if you think about the biggest employer in the private sector in the United States or in Germany, it's the car 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 manufacturing, and <coughs> that is set to be absolutely disruptive, both on the um, kind of power drive side as it moves to electric, and then on the, um, the, just the, the industrial side, the way they're put together. And so you have this, you know, 50 year long or more dominion of these big global multi, multi billion dollar car companies that are being challenged by upstarts now as never before, whether it's Tesla uh, here in California or, uh, Rivian, which is uh, another electric vehicle manufacturer, just came out of uh, a grad student at MIT, put it together, you know, nine years ago, and now they're, you know, challenging some of the big players or Chinese uh, manufacturers, etc. So it's in for a lot of disruption and smaller players. That's what makes it so interesting, also. And it, it seems like you also found that on the public side as well in the time that you spent with, you know, my hero Solita Reynolds and. And uh, Christopher Hawthorne and Joshua Schenk at Metro. <coughs> Absolutely, and that's um, that's another thing that's just so interesting because I come at this, after all, from from cities. I look at cities, and that's you know what I've done for a lot, a lot of a lot of my life. And when you look at cities, you have to look at the mobility revolution, mobility disruption. What's become so interesting lately, in the last you know, two or three years, is how quickly cities and municipal officials, you mentioned some of them, like Salida Reynolds, head of LADOT, are becoming really sophisticated, active players. Because cities traditionally have been quite passive when it comes to mobility, when it comes to many things. Um, I think city officials haven't always understood uh, the digital revolution, etc., um, and now they are in really extraordinary ways. You're getting city officials who are very, very sophisticated and as good as anybody in the private sector and in Silicon Valley, which is great um, because, you know, two or three or four years ago, you had an Uber just barreling into a city and essentially writing the rules, or Bird just coming in and, you know, putting 10,000 scooters in a, in a, in a neighborhood. That's no longer going to be the case. And I think cities are understanding that they have to be active players in their future. And I, by the way, I really commend you and your colleagues in Culver City because you know, I think you're a, you're a really good example of what can be done in this geography of, of you know, greater LA. Well, that, that's definitely one of the things I want to talk about and that I want to get into when we, when we open up the conversation to, to, to the rest of the audience um, is, is issues here in Culver City. Um, and just just to it's a good moment to go into a bit a bit more of the background uh, in regard to Culver City and mobility here in Culver City. The the when we first started talking about our our uh, general plan update of actually doing it, and I know Megan had been pushing it for a few years before we actually got started, and finally we were actually able to get it on our agenda, and now we're full in it. But we we um, you know we. Mobility was a huge part of our selection, pro, you know, select, of selecting the consultant, 
um, and we, we talked, I, I talked uh, quite a bit with uh, the sort of insider baseball famous uh, former planning director of Vancouver, Brent Todarian, yeah. um, whose whole thing is design against the car, um, is how you make a city work. Um, and then, and then we, we had, uh, uh, our team had Jeff Tumlin as our mobility guy with Nelson Negard, and we very sadly lost him because he's now, now uh, director of, of the transportation department in San Francisco. Right. Um, but the, one of the things we're going to want to be talking about is how, you know, we, we've talked a lot about it here in Culver City, we have, we have our plans, but what, you know, from your point of view, uh, both in Los Angeles and also bringing ideas from all the cities that you've looked at and from abroad, you know, what are the things that we can do here uh, in Culver City to, you know, I, I sort of, I have this image of, you have, you have uh, your image, at, again, at the sort of the beginning of the book and the end of the book of this young woman who is, you know, takes advantage of the modern technology and, and you know, and it, you know, there was the, you know, the, you, you had, I think you had invented her in, in an article in 1999 for Business Week and, and how, what she was doing with her phone and, you know, and how it never happened. <laughs> it didn't happen for another five years. Uh, so it was, it was kind of, it was, it was, it was kind of a, a poignant image. And then at the end of the book, you come around and have the same image of, of this woman living through the mobility revolution uh, and how it affects her in her daily life. But so one of the things I want to approach throughout this discussion tonight is here in Culver City, you know, what, you know, if, what, if, if we are to have kind of a mobility utopia with mobility as a service, which we're working hard on, which Rolando has really made a huge progress in, you know, what is it going to look like for us five years from now? You know, the, the uh, you know, your other term that I liked so much was the, the Jevons effect. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Sure. The Jevons effect where, <laughs> where you become successful, so too many people come, yeah. and then all of a yeah, sudden yeah. you're all clogged up, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and then the people don't come anymore, and, 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 it's, and what you started out, you know, sort of bec- what, what started out being your success becomes your doom. We're definitely thoroughly aware of that. <coughs> <laughs> you know, we've managed to, to uh, attract all these big companies. We're having to build more housing. Uh, you know, uh, Milt, who is out there somewhere, his, his, his wife stops me on the street today to tell me to talk to me about all the big buildings that are being built. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, how, you know, mobility, it seems to me, is really a big part of the key to the literal quality of our daily life. Oh, for sure. Here, I mean, here in LA in the future, what you know? So I want to I want to get at what in Culver City can we do to to really maximize our chances of of having you know, and, and we'll we'll get back into specifics about that. Um, you know, sort of your recommendations that you might have for Culver City. Well, I think, I, yeah, I mean, I would say I think you're already doing a lot of good things. I mean, if you look at the um, you know the big LA metro hubs here. Um, they are truly becoming hubs, you know, vibrant hubs, which are multidimensional, you know, shops, you can walk around, etc. And I don't see that happening too much in other parts of this big city. So I think, you know, Culver City is doing a lot of things right already. Look, I think, um, I, it's hard for me to predict the future, but I, I, I think I can safely say that um, the mobility future of Culver City, like other cities around the world, in this country and around the world, will be one multimodal. There will be many different types of mobility running from walking, and I think people will walk more in the future because it will be more pleasant. And if you have these kinds of hubs here and good sidewalks and interesting shops, people will walk more. And they have to. It's good for you also. Mm-hmm. Um, biking. The, the mayor arrived on your electric bike. and it, For those of you who have never ridden an electric bike, it is a lot of fun. Electric scooters. We're only at the beginning of the micro-mobility revolution. And if you think about this particular revolution, is only a couple of years old, already the form factor of electric scooters is changing at almost the speed of light. And, you know, I, I think... Um, at commotion this year, last November, I mean, we had these amazing contraptions. We had autonomous electric scooters. 
where you don't even have to sit on them and you summon them and they come to you. Uh, and, or at night, for example, when they need to be recharged, you press a button and they all go back to a base autonomously. That's here already. Or uh, uh, scooters that have really fat wheels, and they're just fun to ride, etc. And that's going to change and change and change. Um, so, uh, to you know, different kinds of various kinds of autonomous vehicles, and, and uh, whether they're cars or vans, uh, to a lot of public transport, so multimodal. And then the other thing that I'm absolutely sure of, and that is uh, the future of urban mobility will be will depend on a very healthy collaboration between public and private. And so I think cities that figure that out and companies that figure that out will really be in the driver's seat, so to speak. Pardon the metaphor, but... Um, so how, how yeah. have you seen that work, say maybe in Helsinki or somewhere that that we could think about? You know, the the uh, you know I, I mentioned to you that I did that I moderated a panel the other day between uh, uh, Lily Schaub from Lyft right. and and Joshua Schenk from right. Metro, and mm-hmm. and we talked a, 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 and, I, and I hadn't even seen the depth of our own uh, mobility as a service app that I'm going to get Rolando to talk about in a little while. Um, I, but, I just had and, a, a little yeah, demo, James, James demo this evening. It to you, yeah. Absolutely impressive. The, really, really the, good. Yeah. But they, we, uh, you know, Joshua, one of the things he talked about was how, you know, sometimes the private sector is better at iterating than, than the public sector. Um, well, know, I would say the private sector is always better at iter- iterating yeah. than the public sector. So how, how yeah. can we manage that, that, uh, that intersection? How can we work with the private sector? It's like I, we try, but they... they uh, they talk a big game sometimes, but we haven't really gotten Lyft or Uber to really do anything with us. Yeah, you know, we're in the we're in the beginning inning, so yeah. you know uh, uh, it, a lot of it is about to, is going to play out. We have Envoy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> look, I think what's so interesting also is that we're going to be seeing absolutely new kinds of public-private entities and partnerships. Um, if you look, for example, Mayor Garcetti, the mayor of the city next door, uh, at... Um, Our suburb. Our, yeah, yeah, the Culver City suburb. Um, at, uh, he announced, he launched at Commotion LA, in fact, in November, uh, something called the um, Ur- Urban Movement Labs, which is, I think it doesn't extend to Culver City. I think it's really LA city-specific. But the idea is um, to connect all of the big city agencies like the airport, uh, DOT, all the, all the big agencies, and ally them with public, private sector players to look at kind of new kinds of innovation and mobility. So I think they've got um, Lyft has put in a whole bunch of money, Avis, uh, Verizon, uh, there's a fourth one I forgot. Um, you have very similar efforts in Chicago, in Pittsburgh, where city uh, agencies are partnering with private sector companies to, uh, to roll out new services. And I think we're only at the beginning of that again. That's, that's, I, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting <laughs> model. I mean, you know, one of my questions that I have to ask you is, you know, what are, what are the, some of the key things we can do to break down the silos and get past our, our, our own inertia and bureaucracy. And that, that kind of thing of, of pushing those partnerships with the private sector is something that we could do more of. Here yeah, well, I'm all, and I'm sure you will be doing yeah. more of it because you have, you know, you have these very big corporations that are opening up major facilities here, whether it's uh, uh, Amazon or yeah. uh, uh, yeah. some others. And so I think they're going to have to think, and I'm sure they already are thinking seriously about how do their employees move around? How do they get to uh, work? How do they go home? Um, you know, what can, how can they cooperate with you and the city? So we're going to see many more of these kinds of things. Um, the, the, something that you, you touch on uh, in the book a few times, but that, that's not a big part of the discussion, but that almost always is here in L.A., um, Lately, anyway, from coming, you know, largely because of Salida Reynolds at, at LADOT, is you know there, there was a there was a report on this concept of of uh, 
mobility as a service. Mobility as a service is kind of the idea that that uh, we have an app like we're going to be talking about in a few minutes that really connects you to all the multi all the different modes of transportation that you can use so that uh, you know throughout a city so that you can get from one place to another you know you know taking the train the bus uh, you know a scooter a car a bike and it and it helps you figure out how to do that um, and and that it's that mobility is offered to you in a number of ways in a, in a way that can become that eventually will become seamless and transparent um, the the uh, but here in LA what we talk about a lot is the, and the, the quote from this report is from Nadine Lee who's the chief of staff at Metro but she says you know the most important thing is to, to design the system for the most vulnerable customers um, so that so that if your system works for the single mom and her daughter in the middle of the night and they feel safe and they feel like they're going to get where they're going on time, that then it will work for everybody. Is that what we should be making our, our number one priority here in, or, or, or should we be looking at serving a wide array of different users in different ways? I think I would tend more towards the latter. I mean, I, I think <coughs> equity is very, very important. We absolutely have to promote policies that protect the most vulnerable, um, without a doubt. But, um, you know, we need to also make sure that everyone is served. And, um, and that goes from, you know, people at the high incomes going down to low incomes. Um, so it's, you know, I, I, it's a difficult question here in L.A. I mean, I, it's interesting because the equity question in L.A. is much more has a much bigger, prior, higher priority than in other cities in the U.S. and also around the world, curiously enough. And I'm not quite sure why that is, but, um, you know, equity and, and inequity is, is not the same big issue in American cities. Um, it's interesting to, yeah. to realize we are, we are kind of on the leading edge of that discussion, yeah, I, I think, here absolutely. in Culver City. Yeah, the, the, I, I, don't, I didn't see Kelly Lytle Hernandez here. Tonight, but she's one of our residents who, who is who is really a key figure in that discussion. Um, the the uh, just before we open it up, just a, a, just a touch of, of the Jetsons for fun. Tell us about Uber Elevate and the other possibilities. And we, we, we have a we have thorough experience with uh, the concept of digging tunnels <laughs> under under our cities um, that 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 uh, didn't get too far here in Culver City and didn't get too far here in LA, um, but I I love the depiction of of the possibility of helicopter transit and should we be I, you know I wish I wish uh, Craig Hodgetts was here too because he's been involved in this um, but should we be thinking about where we might have facilities for for those kinds of services tell us what what that might look like. <laughs> That's a, uh, one of my favorite subjects. I mean, look, um, if you go back to our first commotion in L.A. Uh, three years ago, and you said to this kind of very sophisticated mobility crowd, if you said the words, or the letters UAM, nobody would have thought, right, what's that? Uh, um, UAM is urban air mobility, and it's, it's become a thing. It's a very big thing around the world. There's all billions of dollars going into R&D in this country, uh, in Europe, in Germany in particular, uh, in China, uh, in other countries, um, into urban air mobility. And this is electric, largely electric, <coughs> uh, drone-like craft, which will take passengers around a city. Uh, one of the reasons why LA is going to be absolutely at the epicenter of the mobility revolution is because it is such a vast polycentric city, urban air mobility is an obvious choice and it will be part of the multimodal choice here. So I can absolutely guarantee you that when I, if I come back here, if you perhaps invite me back in five years' time, um, some of us may come to this meeting uh, with some kind of electric uh, aircraft that would probably maybe deposit you on the roof or next door. Um, that is coming to our cities. It's going to be a very, very interesting uh, battle with uh, urban constituencies. Um, one of the interesting things is that the, uh, the noise part has, is being conquered. I mean, I've seen 
some vehicles, testing vehicles that are almost silent. It's crazy. You think of the noise of a helicopter. I mean, helicopters are very intrusive, uh, polluting device and, and dangerous, as unfortunately we, we saw in the last few days, tragically. Um, these new uh, urban air vehicles are incredibly safe, will be incredibly safe, uh, not very noisy, um, and we're probably in a city like LA, I suspect within five or six years, we'll see thousands of these uh, every day over uh, our, our, in the sky. And so there's also a question, will it be visi- you know, vis- uh, visual pollution, etc.? But I think we'll get used to that. And um, I'm really looking forward to that. It's a very exciting future, I think, ahead of us. And, and, and an interesting point. Um, Am I doing this right? There we go. An interesting point that you made in your description of this is that the business model doesn't work unless it's for, like, a lot of people. So it, it, it shouldn't, it should no longer be something only for the 1%. That, yes. that, it, it, yeah. that for it to work, it's got to it's gotta be that, that many of us could take this. Well, so if you hear the, you know, the Uber Elevate people, and I, I mean, I tend to discount that a little bit, but they, you know, their pitch is that the marginal cost of, of traveling in the air will tend towards the marginal cost of just riding in a car. So, which means that a, a, a you know, that this is 25 years out, perhaps, where, we, where these vehicle, these air vehicles will be autonomous, so you don't have to factor in the, the cost of a pilot. And autonomy in the third dimension is a much, much easier nut to crack than autonomy uh, on the ground. Because you simply don't have kids, you know, running out to the street up there. Right. And it's, it's you know, planes are Planes have been running on autopilot since forever. They're largely autonomous already. So I think that's not an issue. They're them bumping into each other and crashing. Um, they're going to be very, very safe. But, um, yeah, no, no, it's definitely coming, for sure. Well, let's, let's, let's factor that into our general plan. I don't know that's something yeah. we're talking about. I think it's maybe a little bit premature to do that, but, um, yeah. Um, the, uh, so an, another subject I wanted to touch on before we open up is, is uh, the success of, of sort of, I don't, I, 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 for lack of a better term, sort of the social engineering of slowing down the roads, using congestion pricing possibly, um, you know, narrowing the streets to to make it make it uh, cars less attractive. This is really the Vancouver model in some ways, and yeah, you know, and the Paris, and, and, the yeah, Paris yeah. and London model yeah. of congestion yeah. pricing. Um, how hard should we be pushing for that here in Culver City? And how would it? How do you think it might work with the surrounding areas? Oh God, if I knew the answer to that question, uh, I just don't know. I mean, I think. Um, you know, congestion pricing in this town is going to be a very, very, very sensitive issue. It is a very sensitive issue. And I think Phil Washington at Metro has been very courageous in taking it up, really being the first one in greater L.A. to take on that, that, that topic. I think we're going to have to face it, and we, 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 there will be various kinds of congestion pricing. You know, you might pay more to travel in a fast lane, etc., um, I, but, you know, we simply, as a society, we have to get um, people out of cars, and especially just car, these massive big cars with one driver. It's insane in this day and age. Whether it's an internal combustion engine or a, an EV. <coughs> so, it's going to be very complicated. And I think, you know, our society... Thank God, our American democracy is is a wonderful creation. It's very messy and complicated, and a lot of voices have to be heard. I, you know, I much prefer that, and ultimately, I think we'll arrive at the right place on, on issues like congestion pricing. But I, in a way, I, I do prefer that to, let's say, I just came back from Paris um, a couple of days ago. In Paris, the mayor of Paris, and Hidalgo. Uh, you know, it's really top down. I mean, from one day to the next, you know, okay, and two years, no diesel cars. And, or this major thoroughfare, closed to traffic. And, you know, 
forget the consequences. And so it's, it's a very kind of autocratic uh, uh, approach, which we just don't do in this country. It, it fits into the history of, of Hausman and, and yeah, the design I mean, can, of Paris. Can, yeah. can you imagine Eric Garcetti saying, well, as of next week, the 405 will be closed to traffic. I mean, it's not going to happen. I mean, if we could do it, I think I could probably get Megan to close Culver Boulevard. <laughs> but but the, 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 uh, that, that, that would be a nice well, I think, image. I mean, going, just taking the conversation back to Culver City, I mean, I think, look at, you know, Washington Boulevard here is, I, I, I mean, there's such a lot of interesting conversation about what to do with Washington Boulevard, important important conversations and it's tough it's a tough thing it's a major thoroughfare here um, it's you know clogged with traffic but you've got to figure it out it's a democratic we live in a democracy so people's voices have to be heard it's important and, and, and process etc Let, let's get into that in just a minute uh, with, with uh, some of our audience but just before we go to the audience I, I, I wanted to get that report from Davos what do you what do you think happened there this year was it different from earlier years uh, yeah, well, yeah. Because uh, as Tom says, I, I used to in my previous life, I, I ran, um, I was in charge of putting together the World Economic Forum in Davos for quite a few years, which is a wonderful uh, time in my life, and it was great and complicated and uh, it, really complicated. It's like putting a man on the moon to get all the deal with you know, ten thousand Swiss troops, security troops, and uh, you know, heads of state who would come with you know, retinues of the bodyguards and stuff like that, but um, and, and very egotistical CEOs from all around the world, and so it was fun. Um, uh, yeah, I spent that was last Tuesday and Wednesday up in Davos, um, and coinciding with uh, President, what's his name, Trump, who was there, who completely screwed up the traffic, and uh, I missed one of my flights out of Zurich. But anyway, and, and Greta Thunberg was there too. Yeah, and 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 it was. Everywhere you turned, it was, you know, the CEOs, CEOs of Coca-Cola and Morgan Stanley and Citibank. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, we have to save the planet. And all good, but I just the 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 whiff of greenwashing was just everywhere, and it kind of reeked, I think, um, because a lot of these people kind of arrived in Davos on their private jets, and uh, you know, just killing the ozone zone and emitting, I don't know, tons of carbon into the atmosphere. And we'll go back in their private jets. And then when they're there, you know, we, we respect the environment. So it's just, it was really this year I found it kind of off-putting, frankly. And I'm kind of glad I'm no longer associated with it. Very interesting. That's really off the record, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to open it up some, for some questions, but I'd like to, to start out if, if Rolando would help us and tell us uh, a little bit about the app that's coming, a little bit, and maybe recruit some folks to his focus, to the focus groups that they're doing, and tell us a little bit more about, about uh, what we're doing right along these subjects here in Culver City that's really new over the last few months that he's been here. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to speak up. I got to put it down. Oh, voice. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Rolando Cruz. I'm the Chief Transportation Officer uh, for Culver City, and I have just completed six months. It's a good thing. It's, it's a new journey for me, and I tell you, I'm really excited being here. Uh, one thing that we've done just recently is, and, and I love this conversation, this is, it just feeds my soul to hear this. Because even in, within our own organization, we've been having these type of conversations and, and talking about the bigger mobility picture and our actual rethinking what is our vision and our why. And it boils down, we came to three reasons, you know, that we have to rethink mobility. Everything we do has to connect community and it has to enhance quality of life. And that has been the big thing that's been driving us. And so when I got here, one of the things we knew we needed to do was that we needed to improve the backbone of our mobility service. We need to be able to give information to everyone because today is the information age. We need to be able to let people know when the buses are coming. So we have over 5 million trips a year. So we uh, just uh, are in the midst of our soft go live and we're testing out a new application. Uh, we've installed all the equipment on all of our buses. 
It's testing out real well, and with this application, uh, you are able to get the real-time information for your buses. And it is the fastest system in the entire nation. Five-second polling, that means it's faster than what the refresh rate for Google. So every five seconds we're polling the bus, the bus is telling us where we're at, we're doing an algorithm calculation to give that location. And you've got five different ways of getting that information. Uh, one of them is through this uh, 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 Next CC Bus app. It's both available on the web as well as on your phone. Uh, you're going to be able to get it that you can call a number and go through an interactive voice response, get information. At the bus stop, you just text the bus stop number. It'll tell you the next three buses. And then additionally, we're going to throw it in your face because at 74 bus stops within Culver City, we're concentrating on Culver City, where 86% of our ridership actually picks up the bus, there's going to be a sign that will tell you when the next bus is coming. So you can always uh, 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 know where that bus is coming. So what we're doing, uh, I realize that it's important to reach out and talk to everyone about this. And so we started internally. We've got a uh, focus group from our employees that are active rideshare users that are helping us test this out. And we are now reaching out to the community. So we've got a couple of focus groups that are going to start next week. Uh, and we're looking for volunteers. I got some people from Leadership Culver City to volunteer, and I'm looking for a lot more, and I got a great idea today about talking to students and trying to get a focus group of students. So we're asking people to join us on this journey to help us make this software a lot better. I've got uh, some cards. One of our uh, uh, fellow employees can hand this out, and what it is, it gives you all the information about what our focus group is going to do. So we will get you to download the app. Uh, we have a survey that's easy to fill out to tell us how it's going, give us ideas, creativity. And even if you cannot come, I tell you, this software is so intuitive. It is so intuitive. It's very easy to use where you can get your bus stop information. You can schedule it to say, in five minutes, let me know when the bus, when the bus is five minutes away, text me and let me know so that I can go catch it and be there when it's there and ready on time. So all of this is the first step as what we talk, mobility as a service. It's the first step. Let's get the backbone known. And then afterwards, we're going to connect to where are your next scooter shares? Where are that bike share? What about the micro transit that we're going to get ready to start here in, in Culver City? Public micro transit. Isn't that the way it should be? So that's the equity question. So please join us. Uh, and I'm going to end off with one statement. And I've learned this in my entire experience, and I see that it is so true here in Culver City. So, I believe individually people have good ideas, and I believe our department has good ideas. But unless we share those ideas, unless we listen to people, unless we allow people to tell us what's good, what's bad, what can we add, that idea will only be a good idea. Together, by getting all this input, engaging our community, that good idea becomes a great idea, and it becomes our idea. So I really, really seek your input. I seek your, your uh, ideas telling us why does it not do this so we can answer that why. Thank you. Thank you, Rolando. That's excellent. So let me, let me turn that towards John a little bit. Um, the, the, so you saw what we're doing, uh, you know, and I, I, I think we, we can see how, how uh, ambitious it is. What, what, what are some of the, I, I guess I have a two-part question. What would be some of the models that we can look at that I saw in your book? The, you know, Helsinki is certainly one, and then well, that, thing, that thing in Jakarta was very interesting, Well, too. mobility is a service, yeah. which is the idea that mobility is kind of like a utility. It's like water or gas or something, and you can, you know, you have it tracked, you, you, you buy some of it, it can come in the form of a, a taxi or a bus or a bicycle, etc., and it's all in one app. Um, they actually, the, 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 the model and the concept was pioneered in, in Helsinki, which is also kind of a large city, a lot of lakes, and it's it's sometimes hard getting around. And there, some you have to go by bus and a little bit by metro and maybe a private taxi. And so, about six or seven years ago, a very smart Finn by the name of Sampo Heitinen um, came up with the idea of mobility as a service. And the first apps were developed there. Now it spreads. It. I mean, every city in the world has 
some kind of mass application now. Um, so yeah, yeah, no, no. It's and I, I, I really have to commend the Culver City one, which uh, is very, very attractive. I think the drawback uh, is that it's Culver City and it's not the whole city, the whole vast city, greater city. Um, so it, it seems to me it's really great to get from one corner of Culver City to another. Maybe I'm not quite understanding the, the whole thing, but you know, what happens if you live in Culver City? You need to get downtown. LA or, or, or to Malibu, you know, what do you do then? So we'll, we'll, we'll need to have it interface with the rest yeah. of the region. And I, think and there is, I guess there is already and, and, an interface. As, as yeah. It, yeah. Yes. So, so for this, as, as far as public transit services, to get all the information yeah. for Metro, Big Blue, LA Dot, <laughs> Have you seen it work well in Helsinki with, between public and private? Yeah, I mean, I think a better example actually is the, ser the mass service that's recently been rolled out in Berlin. Um, and that it wasn't exactly the city itself that rolled out the application, but it was the... Um, a joint venture of some kind. No, 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 it wasn't a joint venture. It was actually the, the, the Berlin's version of LA Metro. It was yeah. the, uh, the, the Metro, the U-Bahn uh, authority in, in Berlin. And their model is they, they went to every mobility operator, public and private in greater Berlin, and said to, to Uber, to, to the micromobility people, the electric bikes, the uh, taxis, private taxis, and said, you can, use, you can use our service for free. You know, we'll, and the idea was, by the way, uh, I would give my credit card information to the app that's controlled by the uh, Berlin Metro. And Uber would then get their share and with no fee. I mean, you know, the, 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 the so metro authority... Seamless, seamless and transparent. Totally seamless. And it's really, I think that will become the model for a lot of cities. Um, there are a lot of kinks to it. It'll, they'll be ironed out, I think. But you can get, you can get an Uber through yeah, through, the, you through, order the, an Uber through, through that the municipal app. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um. And they'll add, you know, if, if, again, in five years' time, you'll order your air taxi through that, too. Terrific. Well, let's let's go ahead and open up to, to questions. I know I know uh, uh, there's some that I can pull out that that could take up a lot of time. Uh, anybody anybody dying to? Well, let me go ahead and start with with one of those big ones. Then uh, let me ask Ken Mand over there to, to tell us a little bit about the arts district and the recommendations from the TOD visioning uh, process. And and, talk, and and sort of let let's get John to go into a little bit more depth on what he thinks we might do with with Washington Boulevard and with the issue of our cut through traffic and how we can relate. You know, he living in Santa Monica, he has very direct experience of these issues of this kind of congestion. Um, but what are what are how, if you could co just come up and give us a little bit of the background and lay out some of the issues that we're thinking about. Sorry to put you on the spot, but I yeah, just right. I know you know that. <laughs> um, so a few years back, in response, I, I think this is working. Um, in response to all the mass development that's happening here, right along Washington Boulevard and National, um, kind of the impact of that on the community and the community and the community. you know, and the neighborhood on this side of town, and you know, the really on top of all the cut through traffic. So um, the city commissioned this study, spent a, a lot of money, tons of community outreach, and we discussed what possibilities exist for 
this neck of the woods in the arts district and, and also how it interfaces heading you know, into Cobra City and inter interacts with the region is where we started. And basically the result of it was not making Washington Boulevard the most attractive cut through from the 10 down to Playa del Rey. And creating an environment where people are encouraged to you know, get on, you know, get on a bike, take a bus, you know, potential dedicated bus lanes, and kind of reconfiguring um, the public space to make it more attractive. You know, a big challenge we have in the neighborhood is, you know, the middle school and high school is, you know, oh, probably two miles away. And how do parents get there? There's no school buses. How do kids get there? There's the the public buses currently don't serve this area to the middle school. Bayona Creek it has a lot of improvements that are needed. So there was a dozen or so community meetings, workshops, and everything that really laid a groundwork. And we have this great report, this TOD Vision report. But where we're kind of stuck is these things cost money and a lot of willpower to put in place. So, um, you know, it'd be really interesting. And a, another component as related to that, you know, with the TOD and kind of, you know, the so much about mobility and density and housing and affordability and those components go back and forth on each other. Because in a way, density is ties into the solutions for mobility, but if the infrastructure isn't in place to allow for it, then the density doesn't necessarily help the situation. So um, I'm personally very curious uh, if you have any examples around the world where they were able to stagger increased density on the heels of mobility improvements and kind of trigger um, growth in that rather than just keep building and building and then being like, now we're really in trouble. Perfect, perfect question. And then, then, then I'll have some specific uh, comparisons to ask you about. Uh, um, there, are lots, there are lots of different examples. Uh, you know, I think if you look at transit-oriented development uh, as a whole, uh, it's very interesting to look at Asian cities because um, I think they've gotten it really, if you go to Tokyo, for example, which is the world's largest city in terms of population, you know, the place, it runs like clockwork. Um, uh, and, you know, you have five different, it's the largest metro system in the world. Um, there are five different metro lines that um, uh, are all very efficient. They're all private corporations, by the way. I mean, publicly quoted in the stock exchange. Um, they make a profit. The, the ticket prices are really low. It's, you go to any metro station in Tokyo, it's actually spotless. And the way they do this is by um, uh, favoring uh, commerce at metro stations. So uh, if you have the, if you have one of the, if you're one of those metro companies, you have the right to develop the land around the metro stations. It's a model. It's not one we use in this country. I think, unfortunately, uh, I, I would love, I think one of the ways in which LA Metro has got it wrong, unfortunately, is that they don't allow commerce in uh, metro stations. It's horrible. Like, we have to make, it's, I'm, I'm, it's a little bit different from the question you're, you posed, but I, it's something that, it's kind of adjacent, but it, it's, I think it's an important one. You know, the, the biggest challenge is to get people out of cars. And we have a situation in which, you know, actually the ridership in LA Metro has been falling consistently over the last few years, even though there are new lines, etc. Uh, I mean, there are demographic reasons for that, um, but which I can go into. But we have to make uh, the experience of public transit much more compelling, exciting, and, and you know, I want to. I told you I love going on the expo line, but not ev that's not everyone's experience, especially at night, etc. You know, if I'm thirsty, there's nowhere to buy a, a bottle of water in a metro station. There's, you can't buy a newspaper. Well, not that pe people buy newspapers anymore, but a, a candy bar or an apple, or uh, you know, in, in Tokyo or in Paris, you can 
all sorts of things you can buy, and it's vibrant and dynamic. You know, the metro stations here are dead, unfortunately. But uh, hopefully that's going to change. In terms of Culver City uh, and, and our sort of mobility and congestion issues that we're having with all of this new development and all of these large companies that have come here, um, the, the uh, you know, as we know in, in, in Italy, in, in uh, Milan, in Paris, uh, or in Milan, in Rome, in Naples, and in Florence, the, the access for, for, for cars downtown is severely restricted. And they do it with, with uh, license plate cameras. Um, and you can't go into the center so, you know, unless you have a permit to go in there. Um, you know, and then they have the congestion pricing in London. You know, how do you think we could do something like that here? You know, we have, we have our own issues with license plate recognition here. But, but, but you know, could that, you know, how did it work there? Well, I mean, it's very, very sophisticated optical recognition systems, etc. And, and, but it, you can't compare uh, a Florence with a Los Angeles. You know, Florence and the cities that you mentioned, it, very, very dense medieval cores, uh, urban cores. You know, tiny, whiny streets. It's not a grid system. It's, you know, it was built for mules or horses or something. Um, so they really have a... You cannot... They had to do that. It was a necessity as a mother of invention. So they really came up with these uh, systems. I don't think we want those systems here. I mean, we need thoroughfares in LA. Um, I think the future, again, multimodal. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the moments of sort of eureka movement about Los Angeles for me uh, was uh, about four or five years ago. I was living in New York. Uh, maybe five, six years ago, and a friend uh, from L.A., some young, young uh, high-tech guy uh, who I, I had known for a long time, came to visit me in New York, and we were kind of in a cafe. And I, and I said, well, you know, I, I said to him, I said, you know, Michael, I could never live in your city. I mean, I, I just, I hate cars. I like walking around. He said, well, you should come to L.A. because we actually just got rid of our car. And I said, what? Said, yeah, you know, Uber is everywhere, um, and it's cheap. At the time, it was a lot cheaper than it is now. And my wife and I are avid bicyclists, and L.A. is bicycle heaven. I mean, the weather is beautiful every day of the year almost. It's fairly flat, except if you live in some Hollywood Hills. Um, and, you know, if you kind of think in a not-too-distant future... You look at the freeway system, probably the world's greatest bicycle paths. You know, you could, you know, I can imagine perhaps in my lifetime, you know, something like the 10 becoming a bicycle path. And it's just people zooming, you know, quiet, it'd be great. And then I thought, oh, I've got to, I have to visit LA and understand what's happening. And that we, kind of we did successfully close down the Marina Freeway for a couple of events, yeah. uh, running events. It was very interesting to see that. <laughs> How, how about how about they just closed Market Street in San Francisco to cars? Can you know? Yeah, I, was, I, I saw that a couple of weeks ago, and it was. It's not complete closure. I mean, there there uh, there are buses and there uh, I think taxis. I saw a few cars actually, um, and it seems to be working. I mean, you know, we should do that here. We should do that. You know, just close Wilshire or close Sunset. Period. And uh, it'll happen. It'll happen sooner than you think. Uh, sure, let's have some questions. Go, come on up. <coughs> okay. Um, my name is David, and um, so my heart kind of sinks when I hear the future being little buzzing things that are going to go over our head and take us individually to places. Um, you know, it, it feels like that's we're admitting failure that we can't make what we have work. Um, you know, we we're talking about let's make a private tunnel underground so that we can take a private car 100 miles an hour underground. Let's have a, a drone that's going to lift us up over all of our problems and drop us somewhere else. Um, and the amount of energy it would take just to do that. Like, that's like the most inefficient thing I can imagine. It's like, <coughs> like, things like flying them somewhere as opposed to 
going on the ground. And we have incredible like infrastructure now. Like you could go 100 miles an hour on the freeway. We just have too many people, and we're all doing it the most inefficient way possible. So my question is, do you have like how do you convince people that we're, what we're doing now is incredibly inefficient? That there are more efficient ways to do it that actually feel good. Um, but we just can't imagine it. So we come up with these ideas like we're going to fly over everything to fix it rather than change what we already have so that it works better. Let, let me just make a quick comment. Part, part of that is why I'm so proud of Rolando's work because making our, our bus system really is our backbone for public transportation and making that bus system work so that we can get around our city very efficiently and, and quickly and easily. Uh, you know, moving towards that, the app is huge, and having just the bus system work better uh, you know, if, over the next years, I know he's going to do it, is going to be huge. Um, but I, mean, I, I, I don't quite agree with you, because I think you know, th th this third dimensional mobility, I think people will be excited about it. A lot of people will be excited about it. Um, I think we do have to worry about visual pollution and things like that. But I don't think it's an admission of failure. Uh, I think, again, it's about choice and, and the multi-modality of transit options in the future. I mean, today we're constrained. We, we have the car, and that's it, in this city, and a little bit of public transit. The future is going to be so much richer, and I think that's really important. It's going to be a kind of a mosaic of different mobility options. Um, so I, I'm looking forward um, to that uh, to that future. Yeah. Mr. I'm glad you said the word choice because at the very beginning of your talk you were talking about walking, which is one of our basic mobility choices. But what I've noticed walking is that it's getting more and more uh, difficult in the sense that there's noise pollution. And that may not seem like such a big problem, but it's extremely difficult to be walking in a city where it's noisy. If you've walked in San Francisco, it's really noisy. There's a lot of building going on and so on. But here, even if there's no building going on, it's quite noisy because of the car traffic. So it's hard for me to see or understand what you're saying when you're talking about widening our choices. It's like, we'll widen the streets, but you know, no. that's more no, noise. No, I don't want to widen the streets more at noise, all. More yeah. noise, more traffic. It's less like Florence where you're eliminating the choices so that people make better choices. So I, I'm not really getting the message here about this infinite freedom type message. To me, it's, it's incompatible with a progressive future. Fair enough. I mean, I think, look, I think one of the basic things is we have to simply stop subsidizing the cars, which is what we do massively in our, in our country. I mean, our taxes pay for streets for cars. And, and we have to be more transparent about the dollars and cents and where they go. Today in Los Angeles, every single car, private car in Los Angeles, has... Uh, there are three parking spaces per car. We treat cars better than we treat our homeless people. You know, we have 50, 60,000 homeless people, nowhere to live in LA. We treat our cars better than human beings. That can no longer be the, the case. So I think we have to be much more transparent. I think millennials and Generation Z, etc., uh, X and Z, and you know, the younger generation. Uh, they're starting to understand uh, just how much it costs them and society also to have a car. You know, before you, you know, you you, you do anything, it's eight, seven, eight thousand dollars a year in insurance and gasoline, etc. I think a lot of younger people are making the calculation. You know, maybe it's better I have an electric bike or I use public transportation, etc., or shared mobility. But I think it's a kind of societal, uh, secular shift to this, you know, to a new model. 
I believe, I hope so. But I think we have to again, again be more transparent about really what funds are going into subsidizing uh, private cars in this country. I'm Doug, I'm a resident, so. Um, your uh, question about what do we do in Culver City, particularly. Uh, I was, I'm just reading this book by a gentleman by the name of Samuel, Samuel Schwartz. He was the former uh, director of transportation for New York City, and he was talking about autonomous vehicles and how um, our lives are going to be changed by them. And autonomous vehicles are closer than one thinks, right? Uh, you know, five years. And here's, here's my idea. So um, your standard vehicle now is about six foot, six foot wide, but the lanes themselves are like 12 feet uh, in width. So when the autonomous vehicle comes in, they don't need to have like, the, you know, there's no human, human element. So you can actually have the, the vehicle go into a much smaller um, lane. So what you do is, and this is my idea, it's actually Samuel Schwartz's, but you um, restripe all the lanes in the city, which is or in the core area of downtown, you restripe them so you allow, you know, you could almost double the number of lanes that way. Um, right away, you dedicate a uh, lane for biking, you know, more sidewalk space, and then you only permit... Um, like fleets coming through in a, you know, with multi-occupants in each car or bus or taxi coming through the city so that, um, you know, if you're not in a, like, sharing a ride, then you're not coming through. That's my idea. You have a whole chapter on the complexity of, of yeah. all the sensors needed yeah. to... No, I think we, obviously we need policies that favor sharing. I mean, that's really, really important because otherwise we have a pretty nightmarish future in which, you know, so I'm a kind of wealthy guy, I have, a, I have my own autonomous vehicle, you know, at sort of three in the morning, I've had a couple of puffs from my, my, my of weed or something, I have the munchies, and I, you know, I send the vehicle out, you know, two blocks to a Dunkin' Donut to retrieve a donut for me. I mean, that's, that's you know, not impossible that that's going to be our future. But I think we have to make sure that we kind of work to make a, a much more shared future, that the kind of thing that Sam Schwartz is talking about. I think, you know, the technology is largely there. I mean, there are a lot of uh, companies now that are working on what's called platooning, you know, for those of you who may not understand that term, it's exactly that. It's, you know, when you go in a freeway, you can have a series, it's, it's really for trucks now, you can have one truck which has a driver, and then behind it, three or four trucks with maybe a foot between it, but you have sensors that, and so you have these platoons of vehicles, and the, the, the space that's saved is remarkable. Yeah. So that's, that's, really, that's the concept, basically. I have to defer to Madam Mayor, who had a question with him. Thank you. Um, I, I kind of want to go back to what David uh, was saying about just being smarter about what we've got. And um, to me, dedicated bus lanes are the answer. Um, and I, I was lucky enough to live in Paris at a time when um, the pre previous mayor, uh, Delanoe, gave, you know, made one of those really bold decisions. Uh, luckily, Paris is just one government, and it's one transit agency. It's not 88, um, and was able to say, you know what, we are taking away two lanes of traffic, of car traffic, on every main arterial, and we're going to make that a dedicated, protected bus, bike, taxi lane. And all of a sudden, um, taking the bus was the solution. And, you know, you talk about platooning and all, all of those things. Well, the efficiency is that you've got multiple people in that vehicle. 
um, the communications was there in terms of readily accessible maps. Like I grew up in LA and you had to be a transit rider to take the bus, right? You had to know the secret code and what, <laughs> you know, the card and the, the, the schedule. It was highly complicated, but in Paris, you, you're just a person who hops on a bus because it's right in front of you and, and that's where it's going. And so I, I feel like, the, I feel the frustration of in, in our society that we have made the worst things, the worst things for the environment, the easiest to do, and the best things for the environment, the hardest to do. And if we can change that paradigm, like I think we can actually change that paradigm in the next few months if we collectively decided to build protected bus lanes. And um, I... <laughs> And, I, and, and you're like, but you're the mayor. You should just do that. <laughs> um, and, and we'll try. And, that, you know, as you said, it's, it's, a, it's a democracy. There's a process. Uh, I'm lucky I'm going to be termed out, so maybe it'll just be like, let's do it. Um, but, uh, but I think the, this idea that David um, talked about of, of better using existing resources um, means that we are the Judsons, right, already. I, 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 I completely agree. I, I, I would love to see that. I, just I would love to see not only protected bus lanes, but also really good bike lanes, which we, we just don't have here. Um, uh, because, again, you know, uh, you know, it is a city made for bicycles. Not all of us can ride bicycles or want to ride bicycles, just as not all, all of us want to get on a bus, but it's really important means of communication. I mean, if you look at uh, German cities in particular, uh, Munich, where I was recently, or Japanese cities, I mean, a very, very protect la la biking lane. I mean, it's, it's, it's painted a different color than the black asphalt in, in in uh, Japanese, in Munich, I think it's sort of reddish or something. Uh, and it's really, really well used. It's how people get around. But again, it's, you know, it's a pretty dense urban core. But, you know, I would use my bike a lot more than it happens here in LA. And I think a lot of people would. Definitely. No question. Please come on up. Thanks. Uh, I'm Michael. I live right across the street, actually. Um, the p political question, though, I think is serious. And we can compare ourselves to Helsinki or cities like that, but, you know, the pushback that we have here, I think, is pretty dramatic. And, um, you know, when we did the bike lanes on uh, Venice, I think it was, and huge, you know, people don't say anything when it's being put in, but suddenly they're dead set against it. Yeah. <laughs> And, and the thing is that we're, you know, uh, like, for instance, years ago, I was teaching a school mid-Adams, and I was living in Santa Monica, and there was a guy who lived near me, and I said, hey, um, why don't we carpool? And he goes, why? <laughs> and like, well, you know, what do you say? You know, like, if you don't really get that, you know, you're not really going to get it, which he, which he didn't. And so well, they built the expo, which I take all the time, and I, I love it. Uh, the expo line, and um, but they didn't put turnstiles in, which you're just going, really? You know, it just seemed so stupid. Uh, coming, I come from the East Coast, you know, all criminals. Um, but when they start, and then they're going to build turnstiles. And I had this idea, speaking of ideas then, and this is also ties into what else we're talking about, which is to rather than spend the millions of dollars to build the turnstiles, it's like, why don't you start a lottery and have every day this money that you've got, the millions of dollars, somebody's going to win $500 who's riding on the train, on the expo line, or whatever. <laughs> and suddenly, you know, I don't personally play the lottery myself because I can count, but, um, but you know, a lot of people do. And, and I think 
that, uh, you know, I, I sent this idea, I sent it to the Times, they didn't publish it, I sent it to the, the L.A. City Council, because they're the ones, and no one ever took the idea, but I think as a teacher, and as a special ed teacher I was for 30 years, you know, positive things are a lot better than saying to people, you can't drive, or you can't do this, rather than saying, hey, you might win $500 today if you take the train instead of driving a car. That, I think that appeals to a lot of people, but I don't know what you think. Anybody doing that? <laughs> yeah. Come on up, uh, Gerhard. And I go to many meetings like that, and uh, rarely do you hear positive, sensible, intelligent input. I mean, I think this was amazing. And I think that you are in a unique position because of that in Culver City. LA needs an example for how to work differently. Yes. It really desperately, badly needs an example for a different existence than get in your car and drive everywhere. And you guys could be it. I actually live in Culver City, but on the very, very far end, you know, on uh, Beethoven down there, on the very little tippy toe of Culver City. I think this is the best chance we have in Southern California because we don't have an example. I don't think you should mingle with LA. I think you should build a wall around it and forget about them and do something else. Here. Because it's, it's hope. I was at the same conference as uh, Tom was, and I was on a panel there too, and I came away with despair actually from that conference. I was not encouraged at all. It's like, you know, you're trying to solve the same problem, square peg and round hole, and you're trying to hammer that square peg forever, and it doesn't go in, and then you look for a bigger hammer, and then we're all disappointed that SB50 failed, and it's just not going to work. You've got to do something different. And you guys have a chance here to actually demonstrate that. And all these suggestions are great. I agree with everything except for the flying cars. I don't think that we need to do that. <laughs> but... Yes, so I, I think this is an amazing group, and I think you, have, you sit in a really unique position. I mean, in 10 years, if we don't turn around our habits of carbon use, in 10 years, it might be too late to do anything else. I think this could be our best chance we've got. I want to know your thoughts on the new transportation that is coming to LA, which is the gondolas to Dodger Stadium. <laughs> I love it. I think it's a really great idea. I'm not sure it's, it's not going to be a mass thing. It would be great when there's a, there's a Dodger game and stuff like that. Uh, so it, it's not going to serve a you know, massive amount of people. But again, it's part of our multimodal future. And I think it's, it's, it's a more symbolic thing than anything else, just showing people there are other ways of getting around than a car. And uh, it's also a way of, you know, uh, uh, leveraging Union Station in, in sort of an innovative way. And gondolas are a lot of fun. Uh, I have one comment uh, about incentives. So Santa Monica just passed a new... Um, their new sort of scooter ordinances, and part of it was offering a $150 incentive for parking your scooter in a designated lot, which makes a lot of sense. Like one person a day is going to get 150 bucks for doing the right thing. So I think that makes perfect sense. Um, another another question comment. I'm a resident of Mar Vista. I live in the the one mile stretch that got the road diet, and um, our city council member got totally pilloried for that. And you know, for a lot of people who ride bikes or want that downtown Mar Vista to be, to be a more vibrant and kind of walkable area, it made a ton of sense, and we were, we were all for it. But the, the pushback that he got was enormous. There was a recall effort, et cetera. So your point about, um, you know, this being a democratic system is well taken, but I also feel like we need, 
We need leaders to step up and do the authoritarian thing and say, this is what's right. You know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, so, so what happened on Market Street or, um, you know, the redesign of Sunset Boulevard to make it more veteran friendly, I feel like these things, you know, we need the political leadership and the courage to, to just say, we're going to shut this, you know, we're going to shut this street down, but we're going to do protected, bike, uh, protected bus lanes. And I don't know if there's ever going to be the sort of public, you know, the, the groundswell of public support for these things. I do think we need that authoritarianism. <laughs> so so you're, you're encouraging us to be spendthrift and spend all that money to do that. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. <laughs> My question is, what's the, you know, what, what is the, um, what's the role of the It's comp you know, I mean it's complicated. That's why this vast LA region is is so fascinating because it's so challenging, it's so jurisdictionally challenged and siloed in every which way. And um, so I don't know. I mean maybe maybe the eighty eight municipalities have to agree on a single transit czar who would I don't know. I don't know I don't know what the solution is. Well to to address that question from a political standpoint here in Culver City, we, uh, it's, it's, it's very challenging because to do this stuff, it does cost money. And, and we are, you know, in a severe financial crunch with our municipal budget. So it's, you know, the, we, you know, I often feel that we just need to make those decisions and take that heat when, when, some of, when some of our constituents say, you know, how can you be spending this money when you're telling us we don't have this money and you, and you want to continue the, the sales tax, you know, and, and et cetera. So we just have to say, look, it's going to make all of our lives better to spend this money. And then I also think that, that your suggestion earlier of, of uh, that we need to work, you know, more collaboratively with the private sector, particularly here in Culver City, where we have all of this private sector activity going on. I think we need to lean on them and collaborate with these companies to help us make our city work. So that's certainly what I think Megan and I are trying to do. I mean, I think what I, can I agree with you. I think there's another aspect, and that is, you know, there is a big, big, big constituency, constitu constituency in this country that is very attached to the cars. Yeah. And, you know, if we think of the constitutional battle we have in this country over the Second Amendment, you know, I, I'm worried that cars will be tomorrow's Second Amendment issue. Uh, Pry my steering wheel from my cold, dead uh, hands, yeah. But believe me, I've heard people talk in those terms at, at public meetings in this country, in this town, in this city. So that worries me a little bit. <laughs> Okay, I think, Ashley, can I have one more? Okay, well, uh, last. So you're saying it's not about the, everyone having to go out of the car. It's just the natural percentage of people willing to get out make the whole system better. Yeah. Is that 5%, 10%, 20%? Yeah, you, you do talk about that in the book in, uh, toward, toward the end. There's, there's, there's uh, one, of, one of the, one of the, uh, Entrepreneurs talks about how, how you know that if you get a certain percentage off of the cars off the road, then everything flows better. And Mayor Garcetti talked about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, it's not that big of that. Yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I can guarantee you, when we meet, if we meet again, even in a year, the landscape will have changed considerably. I mean, it, it's things are moving very, very, very fast. It's the sense of urgency about the climate. Uh, is people understand the issues more. I think we have to be more transparent with people and tell them what's at stake. And uh, again, it's, and the sector is so fascinating because it's being disrupted very rapidly. And we're, we're really appreciating it. And in that way, we're very lucky to be here in this place. Yeah, here yeah, now. Sure. So can, can we get a big thank you for John Rassant? I, I want to move here, right? It's all the city, so. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, everyone, for coming. Sorry. Oh, we have we have uh, John's book from Book Soup in the corner. I'm sure he'd be happy to sign some books for you. Um, and and so we'll be right over here on the left hand side.
And, and once again, thanks to Envoy for, for hosting us.